Hello everybody. What I want to do today is to talk you through one of the biggest mistakes that human beings have ever made. Now, let's just try and describe science to you. You might think we've got science all sorted out. Beautiful descriptions of the solar system using Newton and Einstein. But no. If I look in this physics book here, there's no solar system. And I can't use my physics book to explain what happens in chemistry. So we teach them in separate departments. And I certainly can't use it to explain what happens in genetics. Now all this DNA here, that's just atomic particles. But physics can't explain this order and organization. The jewel of physics at the atomic level simply describes the motion of one electron in a magnetic field and how it interacts with light. Now, the description of a single electron to the whole of genetics, that's a big step. I end up in contradiction. Here's why. Let's give you a description of what physics, what defines physics. Classical physics is characterized by the principle of complete determinism. And that means it's predictable. I know what it's going to do. Complete determinism. But we know that in physics, we've got beautiful physics that describes the flow of liquids and gases. But that goes into turbulence. And turbulence is not deterministic or predictable. So what is it? And the solar system, let's read the solar system to you, what it is. Though the planets have been stable historically and will be in the short term, their weak gravitational effects on one another can add up in unpredictable ways. For this reason, among others, the solar system is stated to be chaotic. Well, chaotic and predictable a contradiction. And there's another contradiction. If I'm trying to explain everything using physics, I only have the second law of thermodynamics. Now this just averages everything out. It always goes from order into more disorder. But the reality that we see ends up in very, very complex behavior. At the atomic level, I've got DNA and chemistry. The physical level, I've got all the physical components and systems in my body. The behavioral level. And then the solar system, it's very, very complex. And the solar system, well, it used to be more accurate than the clocks that we had made to count it. And then biology and cognitive systems. So at every scale and level in the universe, I have this organization which cannot be explained by physics. So at the minute, we're stuck. We just teach chemistry, genetics, biology, mathematics in separate departments and just leave it that way and we could go on but if we are trying to design things just using physics but the reality that we see uses all the other fields of science we're working with one hand tied behind our back so let's see if we can solve the problem and go back in history to when we first stated that we thought that one day physics would explain everything. Well, I'm going to say we'll go back to Newton and his laws, which come up with predictable orbits for the planets. That's when we first thought that maybe one day there would be laws for everything. But Newton was in for a big shock. And that shock came when he tried to use his equations for three bodies in space. Everything works perfectly for two, so I can have the sun and the earth, but three bodies in space 
shock. There are no algebraic expressions that will give you a solution to determine what is going to happen for three bodies in space. Now that was proved by Poincaré. That's a real shock. In the solar system, I've got deterministic behaviour, but not completely. I've got chaotic behaviour. The little particles of ice inside the rings and belts, lumps of rock. Everything's tidied up nicely. When I look at the rings of Saturn, I see self-organisation. So I need a description which allows for deterministic, non-deterministic, chaotic and self-organisation. All one simple description that cannot come out of here. But let's see if we can go back and make a change. And that change, when it's done, if it's correct, means that I should be able to describe all of this with consistent information. Now the only field of science which is fully consistent with itself is mathematics. So if I go down to the base of physics, just to see what's there that starts it all off, what do I find? Well, if I go back in time to the Big Bang, or a time when there's just energy and space, we now call space negative energy, but there's little particles, discrete bits of energy. But what are they? Well, we'll just take three from the standard model, the quark, the neutrino, and the electron, and we'll just see what we've got there. There's no volume, so I can't say it's a physical thing. And now we've found the Higgs boson, and we realise that that is just a relationship between these particles and space. The Higgs boson carries that mass. There's no substance, there's no mass. So if there's no volume, and there's no intrinsic substance, what is there? Well, these are described by their quantum numbers. Now, I'm not the first person to have this idea. So let's have a look at this. This is Mr. Max Tegmark, a very respectable scientist. Let's see what he says these little particles are. So, what are quantum numbers, like energy and charge, made of? Nothing. They're just numbers. Elementary particles are completely described by their quantum numbers and have no intrinsic properties besides these numbers. And yes, string theory or a competitor may deepen our understanding of what particles really are, but all the leading theories replace one mathematical theory with another. So if I go down underneath the physics, I just have mathematics. And because there is no logic which demands that our description of the universe must be all based on physics, Maybe we should change our mind. Let's try and describe what we've got using a combination of mathematics and physics. Physics is a small part of it, but I've got to get to chemistry, genetics, and biology, and social behaviour, and cognitive behaviour. Well, if I go down here, I've got singularities, or just single entities, just a relationship between energy and space. Now, if I'm going to say that the, I stop looking at what the entity is because I can't see anything there, I say maybe the unit of the universe is actually the relationship. See, what, if I can build all that I see in the universe starting with what I've got, the basic entities. Well, the forces, which are not physical, the first thing they make are stars and elements. Now you read the physics book, it says that gravity makes the star. That isn't true. Because if I don't have this energy here, pushing that star up, and it's coming out of the elements which are making themselves, I don't get the star. So the star is a relationship between what's happening at this gravitational level 
And what's happening at this level, the atomic level? It's a relationship between the two scales, the strong nuclear force and the weakest force, gravity. So that's what a star is. It is a relationship. Now that's very simple. I've got physics, physics which is predictable. But in the star, I've also got turbulence. I've got convection currents. So I also need another kind of mathematics. Now turbulence isn't in the physics book because physics is predictable. Turbulence is unpredictable. Now, in the last 30 years or so, we've begun to uncover models which can describe chaotic behaviour, turbulence, and self-organisation. Self-organisation, you might think, well, that's going to be predictable. It's not, because you can't predict what it's going to make. That's what's so difficult about chemistry. I can't look at the atomic particles and predict all the things they're going to make. So it's unpredictable. But it's not physics. Now, chaotic behaviour, turbulence and self-organisation are all in the same book. They're all in the same field of study. It's called complex analysis. It used to be called chaos theory. Chaos, non-linear, unpredictable dynamics. This is not physics, it's pure mathematics. But in here is all the missing parts of physics which I need to describe chemistry, genetics, biology, social systems and cognitive systems. So if I say I'm now going to describe the universe as a mathematical structure, I can use whatever mathematics I want, I simply have to put physics and complex analysis together. I do get a description which matches what we observe. Self-organisation. Let's just read what that is. Self-organisation occurs in a variety of physical, chemical, biological, robotic, social and cognitive systems. Examples can be found in crystallisation, thermal convection, chemical oscillation, animal swarming, neural networks. So there you are, everything you need to describe the complex reality that we've got. But I've got to just put these together. I've got to stop saying it's all going to be physics. So if I go back here, my physics, predictable physics, just stays here. Very quickly, when I get to three components in the solar system, I go into complex behavior, which can be chaotic. Or if I've got a big dominant body like Mars and its two moons, I get self-organizing, self-organizing, but inside here it's chaotic, but it doesn't matter. I've got a description now which is consistent. At the atomic level, I get life. If I just tip all these elements into the ocean, yeah, the earth, I get chemistry evolving. Physics doesn't evolve, but mathematics does. Mathematics, the more mathematics you make, the more you can make. Now, there's an idea that mathematics is just coming out of people. But we're going to say that people came out of mathematics. So we have to stop looking at the universe from a human perspective. We need to look at humans from a universal perspective. So all this organisation which I'm getting here now has a consistent explanation. And I'm going to get patterns. Mathematics is just patterns. The two biggest patterns, the biggest atomic pattern, it's just a pull and a push caused by two conservation laws, and one made of stars, and one made of molecules. I get the same shape, but this is not a system. It doesn't have parts which act against each other, which gives me a solar system. Now that's what this is, a description of what happens when parts don't act to the laws of gravity or the atomic forces. They act against each other. And that's what nature does. So when I look at animals, their bodies are shaped by the medium in which they move. Animals' beaks are shaped by the flowers, and the flowers shape themselves so that the animals can recognize them. That's what I see, and that's what I've got a description of here. So I think we really do have to change our mind. 
and say there are three universal kinds of behavior. There's behavior for complex things. Now, this has a proof of universality. It's underpinned by two transcendental irrational constants, just like the rest of mathematics. I get universal diagrams and behavior like that, which occur in mathematics. The Mandelbrot steps produces one. Insect populations, turbulence, electrical circuits, so the same. All the same. I get physics for atoms, small things, physics for stars and planets and big things, so I've got small and big and complex, three. Anywhere in the universe you only need three components to make your complexity. So there we are, a very, very simple, logical description of the universe. Max tries but he doesn't get involved in this book, he's still looking at physics. And he ends up with four universes. But here's a, a description that doesn't need other universes. It just needs what we've got and a bit of common sense. So there we are. The mathematical universe. See you soon. Bye-bye.